Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program where we are entirely intrigued by, concerned with, and realizing the you know, enormous importance of the Bible. The Bible, it is the Word of God. And therefore, this program for the next hour and a half is dedicated to talking about the Bible. Whatever issue is brought up for discussion, in my role as host of this program, I will endeavor to relate it to the Bible, to the truth of the Bible. Now, it is true that many, many, many people have ideas about what the Bible says. Some of these ideas uh, they have developed uh, because of a particular denomination or church that they belong to. Some because they have been thinking about certain issues and have tried to find something in the Bible that would back up what they believe, would like to believe to be true. Uh, and there might be a whole variety of reasons why someone wants to look at the Bible. but. The point of this program is to try to find the truth of the Bible. We really want to try to understand what is truth. And in order to come to truth, it means that we have to carefully compare Scripture with Scripture. We have to check out ideas all through the Bible. We have to be ready to examine any Oh my we have to we'll have to back up just a little bit because we had a little problem with the microphone here in the studio. Uh, we are talking about the fact that we want to know more and more from the Word of God. The Bible is the authority. Now, we receive uh, questions from many places, and uh, we uh, receive quite a lot of questions from Nigeria in Africa. And uh, this question is, what does Zion typify in the Bible? Spiritually, what does Zion, the word Zion, represent? Well, you know, in the Bible, God gives a series of words that represent the kingdom of God. Uh, there was Jerusalem. Now, Zion actually was a, a part of Jerusalem. It was a high hill in one corner of the Jerusalem wall that was called Zion uh, it uh, but uh, so whenever we read the word Zion it is like the word Jerusalem it is representing the kingdom of God God used words like Israel like Judea like Judah like the land of Canaan uh, the promised land uh, the land of milk and honey all of these were focused on uh, representing the kingdom of God in a, uh, by something that existed at that time. Uh, now, once we got past the nation, uh, the uh, cross, and Christ went back to heaven, the nation of Israel, the literal Jerusalem, the literal Zion, the literal temple, no longer were representative of the kingdom of God. When they, these words are used in the New Testament, and many of them are, Israel is used, uh, Judah is used, Judea is used, the temple is used. Invariably, it is pointing to the local congregations who, who in turn, are throughout the New Testament era, most of the New Testament era, uh, externally representing the kingdom of God. But finally, the kingdom of God, of course, is a spiritual kingdom, and it is not uh, 
There is no place in this world except in the hearts of the true believer that the kingdom of God actually exists. exists. And when I say true believer, I'm talking about someone who has truly received a brand new resurrected soul who indeed has uh, uh, had all of his sins paid for and uh, that would include only those that God has truly saved not just because someone thinks they're saved but because they actually have become saved but uh, uh, now we're going to go to our and we thank Nigeria for that question and now we're going to go to our first caller on our telephone lines good evening welcome to open forum yes good evening um I understand about salvation and all that God draws us and everything and that uh, we have no free will but my question is after we become a Christian in Philippians 2 12 and 13 yes where it says we work out our salvation and then it's uh, well if you want to read it with fear and trembling for it is God who works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure correct uh, that he works in us to will and to act according to his his good pleasure now my question is then okay so as we're working out our salvation as a Christian and we're we're trying to um, deal with temptation that comes in from the old self from from the the physical body and everything and we have our new self is it God's will that just takes totally over us and that struggles with the old self well, um, you I'm know, trying to get a grasp on this because I used to believe in free will um, a long time ago and, and it's just all coming back you know I'm trying to sort this out in my mind yes, and, yes. and for my yes. eyes to, and ears to be opened I understand you know uh, let's say let me uh, say what we can know and there are some things we can't know we do know that before we're saved uh, we, there is not a great struggle with sin because both in our body and our soul or spirit essence we love sin we're in agreement in our desire to have our own way and do our own thing now if we are uh, thinking that we've become saved then we're going to w be working very hard to prove our salvation by trying to do the will of God and then it will be a struggle it will be a hard time because uh, everything within us rebels against this idea of being broken before God we really want our own way and yet we know if we're a true believer then we have to we should be living doing it God's way and so contrary to what we have become because if we haven't truly become saved we we still uh, uh, love our sin uh, uh, too much uh, we uh, and yet we're trying to do it God's way all right now we become saved God does the miracle a gigantic miracle of giving us a brand new resurrected soul something else happens also not only does he make us a new personality in our soul now our body didn't change that still is the same old spiritually dead body that lusts after sin just like it did before we were saved and and desires to have its own way just as we were before we were saved but now God has given us a new a brand new soul in which we never want to sin we read in first John chapter 3 verse 9 first John chapter 3 verse 9 that which is born of God cannot sin we now have eternal life in our new soul and sin is very uh, objectionable to us and uh, therefore the first thing that happens is that as we f begin to our body uh, still be lusts after sin in one way or another and if we begin to move in that direction there is conflict within our personality in our new soul we don't like it we are we have found that we're happiest 
when we're doing it God's way and already therefore there is serious objection in our life to that sin now more than that the Bible tells us that God energizes us that is before Adam and Eve sinned mankind were perfect and they were completely energized by God it's like it's like uh, in your room you have a a lamp let's say and uh, and it's at night time and the lamp is plugged into the wall into a uh, into a outlet an electrical outlet so that it is being energized by the electricity that has come into your house and then you pull the plug out of the wall and break that energy source of energy and now that lamp is dark the room is completely dark now that's exactly the picture of what happened in at, at the time Adam and Eve rebelled uh, they had been energized by God but but uh, uh, when they fell into sin that contact with God was broken they still had a soul they still had a spirit essence and that's the characteristic of every unbeliever but there's no energy flowing in spiritual energy flowing into that individual from God more than that they were indwelt by God and when we and we don't understand that of course because how can Almighty God, who is infinite, infinite in every aspect of his being, indwell a person? But the Bible clearly says that God indwells us when we have become a true believer. So now here we are. We, are still, we still have a body that lusts after sin. We have a brand new soul in which we never want to sin. We are energized by God. We're... Uh, that is, we, uh, we uh, uh, can uh, lean back on his power constantly. We can go to him for help. And he is always uh, 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 within us, concerned with us, uh, doing what is pleasing to him. And so there's a vast change that has occurred. But we still have a body that lusts after sin. Well, then, we, because we have this tremendous change in our personality, and it's a tremendous change uh, from, being, uh, from the time before we are saved and, and after we're saved, there's a big change. It's not just a little change, it's a big change. And uh, that is why we read the language of working out your salvation with fear and trembling, it is, but it is God who works in you. In other words, he is energizing you, and he indwells you. Uh, in fact, uh, if, you, uh, if, you, uh, if we're a little bit slow in getting victory over a sin, we follow the lusts of the flesh a little bit too long, God will come along and chastise us. And my, if we're a true believer, we'll know immediately why we are chastised. Uh, because we've already been struggling with that sin. We didn't like it anyway, and now suddenly we find we, we uh, uh, absolutely don't need that sin at all in our life. But then, after all of this, uh, this is what we can understand, what I've just laid out here. But when it's all said and done, any good thing that comes out of our life we are not going to take credit and say, I did it, I did it. It, uh, it was my will. We're going to have to say it is God who worked in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. Not only do I gladly and, and I'm wonderfully blessed to be able to say that to God be the glory, totally to God be the glory for my salvation, so can I say to God be the glory how wonderful God is that he has gu guides my life and indwells my life and energizes my life so that I w have this want to to do the will of God and I don't want to take any credit for it at all. And thank you for calling and sharing 
And, and, uh, and so shall we take our next call, please. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Campy. I'm going to blow my radio. Yes. Do you think that the eighth day is the uh, first day uh, from the uh, Sabbath day, Saturday to Sunday? It changes over to the eighth day, which is the first day of the week? I, the Bible doesn't use that language that I'm aware of, and so while it is true that if you go seven days, the next day is the eighth day, but it is also the first day. It is also the beginning of a new seven. So uh, I suppose you could say Sunday is the eighth day, but no, but uh, uh, God, uh, I'm not aware that He uses that language. Uh, what is the interpretation of the eighth day? Uh, to uh, what does the uh, number eight really actually mean? Well, that that is a I, I really don't have a real good answer for that. The, the eighth day does occur in several key places. Uh, for example, a uh, a baby was circumcised. A male child was circumcised on the eighth day. Uh, it is true that on the eighth day after the Feast of Tabernacles, it, the Feast of Ta Tabernacles continued seven days, and incidentally those seven days were not uh, co coincidental with the days in the week. They, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles could begin on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Saturday, any, any day, uh, but the eighth day was also a very important day. But I have not been able to come to any uh, synthesis of this and be able to say, now the eighth day represents this or that. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yeah, could you turn your radio off, please? Yes, sir. How are you this evening? All right, go ahead with your call. Well, I have a comment I'd like to make about something that you said earlier today on the radio. Yes. And then I have two questions, if I may, after that. Yes. Um, in regards to the great multitudes that are being saved, but uh, no man can number. Yes. Them simply because only God knows these things. Yes. And the fact that the church has kept record of its members to me means absolutely nothing in regards to that. And earlier today on your show, you seemed to think there was some connection to that, and I don't believe so. I just believe that the great multitude, uh, excuse me, the great multitudes that are being saved can be uh, not numbered by man simply because only God knows these things. Is my comment. And uh, my question is, um, if and when 2011 comes and goes, and the world as we know it is still here, uh, will you be humbled and your spiritual eyes opened to the fact that Judgment Day does come uh, for all of us when we die, and that that's when we're judged whether or not we're innocent or guilty in our hearts? Well, you're, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get your question. If if what happens? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We must have lost that caller. And shall we go to our next go to our, next, go to our, uh, our next call? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, Mr. Camping. Um, I live in Dixon, and I was wondering if you ever had any homosexual thoughts. I'm sorry. I was wondering if you ever had any homosexual thoughts. Oh my, my, my! Uh, you're asking me for a, a personal testimony of of what sin I might ever have had. It happens to be that that has never, never been a sin in my life at all. But uh, but uh, I certainly have had uh, sinful thoughts in the past. But I'm not about to start speaking about what I might have had sin about. Uh, I have a body that lusts after sin like anybody else, and I pray every day that the Lord will give me wisdom and give me strength and cause me to do it God's way and only God's way. We can't depend upon ourselves at all. We have to look for Him to strengthen us right down the, the right path. But thank you for calling and sharing, 
And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good night. Uh, good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Yes. Yes, I have a question to ask. I would like to know where in the Bible you'll find dear God said we must worship Sunday. I know he said remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's the only day he said that we must remember. But you said Sunday is a day of worship. Well, but the fact, it depends uh, uh, if we're listening to the Bible or whether we're listening to our church. Now, if you are a Seventh-day Adventist, for example, the Seventh-day Adventist church has a different authority than the Bible alone. They, uh, they are an another kind of a gospel. They're not the gospel of salvation. They're a gospel that is formed in the mind of their church fa founder, Mary Baker, or no, uh, Ellen G. White, and included, amongst other things, she believes she received visions which included a halo around the fourth commandment that had to do with the seventh-day Sabbath. And so if you're a part of that congregation, you are going to be convic convinced altogether that uh, we are to worship on Saturday, that it is the Sabbath today. But, uh, uh, as I said, that's an entirely different gospel than that of the Bible. It has a different authority. It has the authority of uh, the Bible together with the authority of Ellen G. White. And since she wrote later than the Bible, uh, therefore uh, it carries a, gr a, gr a heavy weight and, and is a, uh, it makes a difference all, uh, on everything that these people in that church understand about the Bible. But if we listen only to the Bible, and that's the true gospel, that is the true gospel, the Bible alone and in its entirety, then it's very, very clear that the seventh-day Sabbath was a shadow of things to come. It was a sign pointing to the fact that uh, we're not to do any work trying to get ourselves saved, even as Israel was to not do any physical work on the seventh day, so we are not to try to do any uh, spiritual work in trying to get ourselves saved. And, and uh, it, like the other ceremonial laws, the offering of b blood sacrifices and burnt offerings and observing special feast days like the Passover and the new moons and so on were shadows that were completed when Christ came and so we don't observe that anymore we don't observe the seventh day Sabbath any more than we would uh, want to offer a, a burnt uh, offering or a blood sacrifice it would be just as uh, wrong to do that and, uh, but God did give us another day, and he said that in Matthew 28, verse 1, as well as in uh, other passages of the Bible. He said in the end of the Sabbath, uh, on that Sunday morning uh, that occurred at the time that Christ arose, in the end of the Sabbath, uh, uh, that is an era of Sabbath has come to an end as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath, Sabbaths, plural, that is a new era of Sabbaths has begun. Our Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and, so, and the other women came to anoint the body of Jesus uh, because now it was uh, no longer a, uh, the seventh day Sabbath and they could now begin to work again. But in actuality, it was a day that God had set aside now as not part of the ceremonial law, but as part of the moral law. But I, and let me say again, if you are a member of the Seventh Day, uh, Seventh, uh, uh, the uh, Seventh Day Adventist Church, you will not agree because you are conditioned altogether by the authority on which uh, they operate, and that is a different authority than that of the true gospel. Worship that day, you are doing the wrong thing. I'm sorry? No, I say if you worship on Saturday, that's a wrong day of worship. 
Yes, according to you, of course it is, because you have a different gospel. Um, you are you have a different uh, understanding of the Bible altogether. You also believe that there's no hell. There are other things that you hold a different position on, because you have a different gospel. It is not the true gospel, and I say this very kindly. I say it, however, as a warning. You want to uh, those who are in that particular gospel uh, have a gospel where there's no possibility of salvation. Right at the beginning, they are in violation, and there are many gospels that are of this nature, where God said we're not to add to the words of this book lest you be subject to the plagues written herein, and that's precisely what they, the Seventh-day Adventists have done when they look upon the writings of Ellen G. White as inspired. That's what the Mormons have done when they look upon the Book of Mormon as being inspired. That's what the Roman Catholics have done when they look at the uh, uh, visions of Fatima or Joan of Arc or the infallible utterances of the Pope as being inspired. It makes them another gospel wherein there is no salvation. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Brother Kempe. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but it's E-C-C-L-E-S-S-I-A-S-T-E-S. Uh, it's it's a it's a chapter in the Bible, Ecclesiastes. Uh, I'm sorry. What is the book before it? Um, Proverbs. Proverbs, and the next one is Ecclesiastes. Okay, Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter three. Ecclesiastes, chapter three. Okay. Let's look at that. Ecclesiastes. Chapter 3, okay, we, from what cha verse? Yeah, from verse 1 to 8, uh, in the time of the Vietnam era, uh, where the country was torn apart because of this war in Vietnam, uh, people were demonstrating as to our brothers being killed, etc., etc. Uh, a band... Yeah. Excuse me, can you hold on just a moment? Where I'll be right back with you. We have to pause for this message. We have a caller on the line who has called our attention to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the first eight verses. And let me just read a few of these because these are very, very important verses, as everything in the Bible is important. But uh, this is particularly of interest to us in our day as time is very rapidly approaching its end. Uh, right now, uh, throughout the history of the world, we live in time. We measure everything by time. But this is what God says about time. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. Now, uh, let me go back to our caller. What did you want? What was your question? Yeah, I, I pointed out back in the Vietnam era, a, a rock and roll group had made a song per this first eight verses of chapter three. And it was a very popular song because it was a very popular era as far as Vietnam, the country being torn apart, etc. And um, 
I heard you mention the other day as far as rock and roll uh, uh, songs nowadays, which I I really agree. But these people had used this song uh, for that era, and I felt it was um, a good thing because they were trying to uh, mention that uh, we were struggling getting away from the Bible, and they brought this to a rock and roll song. And I was just curious what your uh, outlook well, on that was. Uh, of course, uh, how can I make a comment? I know nothing about that song. I have I have never heard that song. But I do know that uh, this, the Bible is a spiritual book. And uh, when we are looking at the Bible, we, it has to relate to the gospel. Everything in the Bible ultimately relates to the Bible. When, it, when, when the Bible talks about a time for each of these things to happen, uh, we have to think about it. Now, how does that tie in with the Bible? For example, a time to be born. Well, uh, yes, uh, we have to be born in order to be part of the human race, but there's also the issue of being born again, and God has his own time for each one, a time to die. And, and again, uh, we know that there's physical death, but there's also spiritual death, and, and that is all set forth in the Bible. And, and, uh, and uh, the God himself has a very carefully worked out timeline for history. Uh, for example, at the beginning of the Great Tribulation that we have just gone through uh, the beginning of, uh, for several years no one was being saved all over the, well, all over the world and, uh, and the, the temple was being torn down. And notice what it says, a time to rend and a time to sow, or a time uh, how did he put it uh, uh, in verse 5? A time to cast away stones, not one stone left upon another. There was a, a time for that, and a time to gather stones. And as we, as uh, throughout the church age, the temple of God was being built of precious stones, as well as stones that uh, will not stand uh, the wrath of God, uh, wood, hay, stubble. Uh, to use the language of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But to tie this to the Vietnam War, no, no, there's nothing in this, in this passage that would tie into that war. I do not believe so. Era. Because of the way the country was being torn apart. And I think what their deed was to uh, bring this to our attention, what we're doing. Yeah, but we're being torn apart by sin, and uh, yeah. and uh, it is uh, we can't mechanically bring the country together. In fact, uh, our country, uh, uh, we politicians and statesmen uh, uh, and others, that is their task to try to do. Uh, but uh, but the only the only hope for any country are for the individuals within that country who right. do become saved because unless we become saved we can uh, get along in that country and and live some kind of a reasonable life but we're still headed for doomsday we're right. headed for right. eternal damnation right thank you brother Kemi. thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. It's very nice to talk to you. Um, my question is, why did God allow men from the Bible to marry more than one wife? Well, for the same reason that God allowed uh, mankind, uh, or not allowed, it's God's program, that we, after we are saved... Uh, 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 well, first of all, before we are saved, we're in complete rebellion. And therefore, before we're saved, and many men who uh, we read about in the Bible who had more than one wife, and there are a number of them named, never did become saved. So that was not a, a very difficult thing to expect, that they would engage in that kind of a sin. Uh, on the other hand, there were some who were 
definitely true believers like David and Solomon who multiplied wives and yet they had a body that had not become saved and God did not have them live uh, perfect lives they lived out their life as an individual who was who uh, had received a resurrected soul but still is is living in a body that lusts after sin and God allowed that to take place to to uh, uh, in, in some cases uh, to a higher degree than another uh, I know in my own life God has allowed uh, sin sometimes to develop but on the other hand I have all, I also I thank the Lord that from time to time he has sent chastisement to arrest uh, this uh, sinful direction or that sinful direction and and uh, so how God works in our lives that's very mysterious but but uh, we must remember and there's nobody that lived on the face of the earth except the Lord Jesus who lived sinlessly and so we should not be surprised when we do see sin here or there Thank you. I have another quick question. Have you ever considered writing some kind of a commentary? Because sometimes I go through the Bible and I remember something that you've said about, for example, just, you know. Well, you, I, you know, in, as I've been able to uh, be used of the Lord as a servant from time to time, I have written beginning with the book Adam Wynn, which I wrote about 30 years ago. And then following that, uh, uh, I wrote maybe another dozen books or so, or booklets, uh, right up until the book that I uh, is now, uh, that I just had finished, The Time Has an End. Uh, is, I can tell you this, that for me to write is very difficult. That is not my gift. Uh, I can speak. It's easier for me to speak because if I make a wrong sentence, in the next sentence I can make correction. And you can't do that when you write. Every sentence has to be right uh, when it's finally on the printed page. And so it, it requires a lot greater accuracy. And, and so I have to work at it very heavily. And, and uh, the only time that I uh, really have a real desire to write something is when I feel that here is some truth that ought to be put down in a way that people can read about it and benefit from it from whatever I have learned from the scriptures and uh, but uh, that's that's uh, that's about as far as I can go and in addition of course my life is exceedingly busy with teaching and with management and and uh, thinking out programs for expanding family radio and so on I appreciate th your time. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello. I'm sorry. I had called earlier, and I had a follow-up question. Um, in submitting to God's will, you know, and resisting sin and everything, now as a Christian, uh, can that be an act of the will since God's will is now ours and we have to make like a decision like when we're tempted to say, no, I'm not going to do that? Can that be called an act of the will or, or how would you explain that? Oh, well, when we are truly saved, uh, you're, let's, let's get back to the issue of free will. Uh, when we are truly saved in our new resurrected soul, our will is set free. We can decide to sin, to sin or we can decide not to sin uh, because in our new resurrected soul we never want to sin. We're not in bondage to sin anymore. Before we're saved, we are in bondage. We're a slave of sin. We're a slave of Satan. Again, when our, we have a new resurrected soul, Satan does not control our life in any way. And uh, so we can, uh, we do have a free will to a high degree uh, and can make choices. Uh, however, uh, as I indicated, because we never want to sin in our new resurrected soul, it's uphill work to try to live sinfully. We are not happy at all about that. So it's so 
sort of like what Adam and Eve had, but not to that magnitude, though. A sort of what Adam and Eve, yes, yeah. that would be a good way to put it, because they, of course, didn't even have a body that lusted after sin. They were perfect. They had no enslavement in any sense. We are still in our body, still a slave of sin. Uh, but we are to rule over our body. We are not to you know, let our body get away with it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And oh, okay. Shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Um, a while back, a lady called, and um, you didn't get to hear her question. Yes. Um, I, I just happened to hear it because because I was listening to the radio here. I heard most of it. The question she asked was, um, I have a question, too, but I saw I'd repeat her, see if you could um, attend to it. She asked that what if, let's say, the year 2011 comes and goes, and the earth is still here and existing, you know, Christ doesn't return. She wanted to know, would you be spiritually humbled by that? That's yes. what she I, I, I thought that's what she said. I just wanted to ask. I asked her if she could confirm that, and she was it was gone. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, any time I find that I am wrong about anything, I am spiritually humbled. Of course, of course, uh, and uh, and uh, because my only desire is to do God's will, and I want to do it as faithfully as possible uh, of course when we are, are beginning to talk about time has an end it's a it's a big subject it's as probably as important as any we can think of and so we don't get into that lightly we don't do get into that just uh, foolishly or or uh, superficially uh, this is something that uh, uh, is in the forefront of my mind all the time as I study the Bible. And I continue to study and study and study. Every time I, I do a, another program on family Bible study or, uh, or uh, wherever I might teach, I am again studying the Scriptures. And that kind of a question, I can assure you, is always in the forefront of my thinking. Is, am, is there anything in this that I'm presently teaching that impinges upon that question about the timing of the end and and uh, I if I truly believe that if uh, I, 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 I could be wrong about this but I believe that if 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 we're if that time is wrong and it's possible uh, that uh, somewhere along the way either I or someone else who is a very earnest student of the Bible will discover why it is wrong, why we uh, it couldn't be the year 2011, and so correction can be made. And I'm fully prepared to make correction. Fully prepared. There's no, this is no ego involved in this. That I said it, and it has to be right. No way. No way. I could correct in five seconds if someone could show that from the scriptures but uh, I I will say this however that uh, while I have had that date in mind for many many years uh, as I go along continuing this study no other time no other year focuses at all none none focuses and yet again and again that year uh, appears to be the, the the most likely and therefore I don't hesitate to say that there's a high likelihood that that we only have a, at this point in time in the year 2005 six years left for before Christ returns. But thank you. Okay, for oh, brother camping. Yes. Hey, can I ask my question? I just wanted to repeat hers for you. Yes. Okay. Um, I was, I'll take my answer off the air too. I was just wondering if you could go over what the passage about the thorn in the flesh in Second Corinthians 12, beginning of verse seven. Could you go over what all that means again? Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks, G Paul. Camping. Paul is uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is beseeching the Lord on three different occasions and three. It uh, uh, signifies God's purpose, purpose. In other words, it was 
uh, the apostle's purpose, that he wanted to get the message to God that I am experiencing a thorn in the flesh that is grievous beyond measure. Isn't it possible that this might be removed? And, uh, and I've read many commentaries on this, and people have said, well, it was his poor eyesight or, or it was some other physical disability. Uh, uh, you remember he said it was a messenger of Satan to uh, buffet him. But in actuality, the Bible itself tells us what that thorn in the flesh was. We read in Numbers chapter 33, and you know this is a, an excellent illustration of the fact that when we're seeking truth, we, we compare Scripture with Scripture, even as we're commanded to, to uh, uh, compare spiritual things with spiritual, and the whole Bible is spiritual. And we read in Numbers 33, where God is warning Israel, in their day, when they came into the land of Canaan, or were about to come into the land of Canaan. But if ye will, I'm reading verse 55, Numbers 33, verse 55. If ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall be, then it shall come to pass, that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks, that is, thorns in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Now let's look at the Apostle Paul. What, who was vexing him? People. What kind of people? This Here in Numbers 33, verse 55, it talks about wicked people who would be vexing uh, the nation of Israel and would be thorns in their sides. Uh, it was the uh, wicked people of the land of Canaan. And uh, who is vexing the Apostle Paul? Remember again and again the complaint came about the Judaizers, those who insisted on following the Old Testament laws and did not understand that Jesus was the Messiah, and they wanted Paul killed. Remember? He was stoned once and left for dead. He was beaten on uh, several occasions. Uh, he, was, uh, 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 he was maligned. Uh, he was slandered. He was, uh, they were after him all the time. They were thorns in his flesh. And, and it grieved him no end. They were fellow Jews, fellow Pharisees one time, Paul had been a Pharisee, and now they had turned against him. And, oh, was he grieved about all of that. And then uh, what? And so he's beseeching the Lord. Lord, isn't it possible that I could live in, uh, my life without having this constant uh, harassment, this, this constant uh, 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 ridiculing and, uh, and uh, uh, threats on my life from these Jews uh, and God says no Paul my grace is sufficient my grace is sufficient what did God mean by that I have given you salvation Paul that's the grace of God the gift of salvation and as a child of God you can live through this I am behind you all the time ready to strengthen you uh, I uh, have never left you or abandoned you, and you must endure this. And that's a lesson to all of us. We all would like to have a life wherever, where we are uh, understood by our fellow man, where we are never maligned, we are never slandered, we don't find anybody who is looking cross-eyed at us because we are uh, uh, talking about leaving the congregation and so on. And God says, no, nope, it's not going to be that way. There are going to be thorns in your flesh, but my grace is sufficient. Isn't that wonderful? My grace is sufficient. Thank you for sharing that question. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Yes, I want to ask a question. Yes. 
What is the difference between the royal law and a moral law? Or the ceremonial law and the moral law? Yes. Uh, is that your question? All right. Well, we the, the word ceremonial law is not found in the Bible. That's actually a theological. I said royal, royal oh, law. Oh, the royal law and mm -hmm. the moral law. Mm -hmm. There is no difference. The 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 law of God is a royal law. Everything in the Bible is a, part of a royal law because it's the law of the kingdom of God. It is. Uh, stipulated and given to us by the king himself who is eternal God and that law is moral in character it's spiritual in character it's sp ceremonial in character but it is the law of God and nothing is of it is to be disdained nothing of it is to be treated uh, uh, superficially like it is not important we have to look at each and every Thing. In other words, we have to look at the whole Bible. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That is, all Scripture is an integral part of the royal law of God. Okay, I want to ask another question. Okay, yeah. in Revelation? Revelation? Yes? Through His commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life. And, I, and back to what you were saying to another caller that called about the Sabbath. Yes. Now, are you saying that the commandments of God are irrelevant? I know that you cannot uh, work your way through to God, to God, but, you know, that scripture... Uh, no, no, but, you, you know, the problem is we have to read the law of God, this royal law, and discover what is God saying. I use the illustration repeatedly. We have the Ten Commandments, okay? And it says, Thou shalt not kill. Now, you can't know what that means unless you read the rest of the Bible. Because it doesn't, you don't know whether uh, that means that a soldier can ever take a life. Does that mean that a judge cannot find somebody guilty of cap and, and uh, 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 sentence him to uh, execution? Does this mean that we can't kill an animal? Thou shalt not kill. We can't know. The, the real meaning of that until we read the rest of the Bible and then we discover that God is saying thou shalt not murder and so we look at each and every law uh, and and when our, when God speaks of a law like he does the seventh day Sabbath and says this is a sign sign pointing to something we know immediately that is part of the ceremonial law that is, it is uh, pointing to some aspect of the law, namely the fact that Jesus had to be our Sabbath, that he had to do all the work in saving us, uh, and it was typified by the fact that we were not to do any physical work on the seventh day Sabbath. But we only come to that understanding when we read everything in the Bible about the Sabbath day. And unfortunately, and this is true of every denomination, of every kind of a gospel that is uh, 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 people hold to, uh, individuals who are prominent, who are highly regarded by their congregations or denomination, uh, pick and choose from the Bible the verses that they like and and that they could think they can understand and they tie those verses together and draw a conclusion and say this now is what the bible teaches and they can quote a number of verses to back that up just like they do with the seventh day sabbath like they do with uh, free will like they do with uh, uh, a whole lot of other wrong wrong teachings but the biblical rule is that we have to make every conclusion, that is, every understanding that we've arrived at concerning the law of God, uh, subject to the scrutiny of the whole Bible. We have to look at everything that relates, and that's a big task. And not only that, 
we find after a while that we're reading a couple of verses that run counter to what we thought we had as truth. And we don't like that because we were hanging on. We thought we had the truth already, and we don't like to make a correction. We like what we already had. But we can't do that. We have to be come before the Bible broken. I don't know anything. Lord, you teach me. And that's what has to happen when we look at the seventh-day Sabbath. Uh, we can hold that that it still holds today, but if we keep reading, we find, no, it doesn't. And it's uncomfortable, maybe, that we have to change that teaching uh, and our understanding of it, but we better do it if we're going to be faithful to the royal law. But now we're going to pause for a message. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome, welcome to Open Forum. You have no academic or ecclesiastical credentials, yet night after night you are on the air masquerading as a Bible expert and a spokesperson for Christianity. If someone was doing with medicine what you're doing with Christianity, we would put that person in jail as a public menace. You know, wouldn't it, excuse me, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a medical book that was absolutely trustworthy and was always the last word in medical knowledge? Wouldn't that be wonderful if we had that? Then anybody and everybody could go to that book and check up on their physician to see once if their physician who spent years in medical school is really teaching or, or practicing faithful medicine. Now, of course, this is a dream. Such a book does not exist. Uh, and, and so we have to trust that the physicians that are treat us have been properly trained and as a matter of fact, they're learning all the time and there are practices that they engage in today or that they engaged in uh, years in, in the past uh, that they would never think of doing today. I think, for example, that again and again in, in the early days, if someone had a fever, what did the physicians, not the people, the physicians, what did they do? Oh, we have to we have to drain some blood out of that person because they have a fever. Now, of course, that today sounds ri ridiculous to us, but in that day, that is what the physicians taught. And the same thing is happening today. Uh, today, a physician can uh, can uh, recommend a certain uh, drug, for example, for a certain medical ailment. And next year or two years, five years down the way, it may be discovered that that's a dangerous drug. It's got side effects that we didn't know about, and we can't use that drug anymore. So a physician has trained as best he can be trained, and that's what he has. But there is that not that super-duper book that we're, oh, we're, the whole business of medical knowledge has been carefully set forth. And so uh, we are therefore tremendously gratified that when we talk about spiritual things, such a book does exist. Such a book does exist. That book is the Bible. And so anybody, anybody can check out their pastor or their Bible teacher or their theologian, their Bible expert, whoever he is, who claims that they have, and they may have had a very extensive uh, schooling in, in uh, what they believe, but they can be checked out because that Bible is available. And that's where the problem is. In other words, if you're having trouble with this, start reading the Bible. Don't trust me. Don't trust me. I, I, all I can do is teach what I see in the Bible and try to back it up with Scripture, but trusting that people will check me out. Uh, is this what the this super-duper, wonderful, perfect book uh, allows? Does Is that what it teaches? And, and that is 
um, therefore makes this whole matter of teaching Bible an entirely different question than when you're talking about practicing medicine or anything of that character, of that nature. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Dr. Scampin. Yes. Last night, the last call, a girl asked about uh, Romans 9, where it says in verse 13, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Yes. And she wanted to know where it was written. And it's in Malachi 1, yes. verse uh, 2 and 3, I believe it is. Oh, I remember that. Let's look at that. And one more thing I want to say before you hang up. Yes. Go ahead. No, you, you can oh, read well, that. Let, let's read Malachi. Oh, I see. You. Let's read it first, and then you can make your other comment. In Malachi chapter 1, we read uh, um, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. Thank you. That's, thank you. That is a, a, a very, very good answer to that question. Now, what was your other comment or question? Hello. Hello. Yeah, oh, I, I think oh we... Oh, my, uh, we lost that call. All right, go ahead with your question. Yeah, hey, hi, Brother Cammie. Um Can you read Isaiah 54, 17? Isaiah 54, 17. Yes. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord, that is, saith Jehovah. Now, what is your question or comment? Um, I didn't really have a question about it. I just wanted you to read it. I oh, do have a, oh, I do have a question me. about... Um, yeah, before you ask your question, let me make a comment. This indeed is a very, like so many, <laughs> you know, when we start looking at the Bible, we always find wonderful, wonderful verses. But this, uh, this is a verse, again, that gives all of us who are... Uh, a finding that we are running uphill against what mankind wants to hear as we talk about the end of the church age or as we talk about the fact that Judgment Day is approaching very close uh, and so on. We're getting lots of uh, uh, unhappy people uh, and uh, slandering and revilifying going on. But, uh, but you know, uh, this verse... Uh, uh, as well as uh, like what we read in Revelation, what, when I have opened a door, no man shall shut it. And it's the kind of statements that reassure every one of us, just stay with the truth of the Bible and leave it with God to carry it out. He'll take care of it from that point on. But go ahead with your other question. Oh, great, thank you. Um, there's a verse... I don't know what book it's in, but um, someone makes a comment to the Lord Jesus um, in reference to praising his mother. Um, Blessed is the womb that bare thee. And Jesus sort of reproves him and gives him a, a, a little bit of information there. I was wondering if you could read that and explain it to me. Yeah, well, that's in Luke chapter 11, I believe. 11. In Luke 11, in verse 27. Uh, and it came to pass, as he spoke these things, that's speaking about the Lord Jesus, a certain woman, I'm reading Luke 11, verse 27, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and the paps which thou hast sucked. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. In other words, it's a very interesting and significant fact here that Jesus, in a very abrupt and direct way, turned the attention away from his uh, from Mary uh, to every and and put our attention on every true believer because Mary was like all the rest of us who are true believers. Thank you so much. 
Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Let me lower the radio. Yes. Okay, Brother Camping, may I ask three questions, please? Go ahead. Okay, you sound very far away, so I lowered my radio anyways. Um, okay, it's true that we're, we're saved through election and predestination, I know that. But um, you know how, my first question is, you know how on, on the prayer, our Father who art in heaven prayer, it says, uh, we, as we forgive those who, to, to forgive us our sins, as we forgive their sins. So isn't, shouldn't it say, um, the other way around? Yeah, isn't um, it, isn't we it, forgive them because they, because they get, forgave us. In, in fact, when we read that sentence the way it's worded there, we can easily form a doctrine, a teaching that uh, God forgives us provided we have first done certain things, that we have come into a forgiven relationship with others. And, uh, and uh, if we just had that verse, uh, uh, well, we could easily adopt that as a theological principle, as a teaching of the Bible. But when we examine that, that conclusion, that that's what that verse is teaching, we know that that is contrary to the whole Bible, because there are no preconditions for our salvation. We're spiritually dead. And then we learn that uh, we... We will only forgive others provided God has forgiven us. In other words, that is the condition of the true believer. That if God has forgiven us, then we have a, a and, and we're truly saved, then we have a, a desire and an intention and a lifestyle where we're, we are ready to forgive those who have sinned against us. So, but then when, you know how... How we, we want to do God's will in, the, in our new resurrected soul, but, our, but our, in our flesh we, we can still sin. So is it possible that a person that's saved will, will not forgive somebody as part of one of their sins? Well, if, if the problem is if we persist in a sin, any kind of sin, whether it's the sin of sexual uh, uh, perversion or if it's the sin of cursing, or the sin of lying, or uh, any kind of a sin, we're going to be asking great big questions. Could it be that I'm not a child of God? I thought I was, and that's a fair question, because there's a strong likelihood you are not, or I'm not, a child of God if these sins persist. On the other hand, if we find that we have a persistent sin of some kind, whatever it may be, and we, we are, it always makes us feel bad. It always troubles us. And yet it's, it's, it's the kind of a sin that we have uh, con become convinced, I can't live without that. I, I, I just have to have that. Uh, that's the way sin deceives us because nobody needs a sin at all but we can be deceived even as a child of God and then uh, finally, finally we don't get victory over that sin ourselves but God chastises us and when he chastises us believe you me we know it it's, it's going to be big chastisement God does not beat on us lightly and we're going to be delighted that we've been chastised, even though it's a miserable experience to be chastised, because suddenly we know I didn't need that sin at all, and oh, thank you, Lord, for giving me the encouragement and the strength and the desire <clears throat> to turn for, uh, forcefully away from that sin. And that's the nature of a child of God. We, we are always happiest when we are turning away from sin. My third question is, are, aren't we trying to get save our own works by, by forgiving our enemies? Yeah. Well, we have two issues here. If we have become saved, we know that our works did not enter into it in any way. However good we tried to be, that had nothing to do with us becoming saved. But when we do become saved, 
and we've received a brand new <laughs> resurrected soul in which we never want to sin again, good works will be uh, seen in our life. That will be our new nature, to do good works. A good work is simply doing anything that is obedient to the law of God. And so if we are truly saved and we're forgiving our uh, those who have sinned against us, well, that is uh, our, the expectation of a true believer, and it isn't like we're trying to get right with God. We've all, we're doing this because we are right with God, because God has already saved us. But if we are trying desperately to prove I'm saved and, and uh, forgiving those who have sinned against us and trying to live a clean, uh, spiritually, morally clear, clean life, and yet we have not become saved, then we're on a wrong path altogether. And as a matter of fact, we're going to find it's very uphill work because uh, it's, our whole personality revolts against it. We really want to go our own way, and, and it's really difficult uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to do it God's way. Sometimes I've talked with people who were... I don't know whether they were saved or not, but I was discouraged when they said, how are you doing? And he say, I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. And, and you know, it's so hard to do it God's way. And I'm thinking, I don't want to be a judge now of this individual, but, but my, my, if, uh, if we're truly a child of God, it's not, it's not a great pain. It's a happy experience. We have a want to an enormous want to in our life. I want to do God's way, and I'm happiest when I'm doing it God's way. Can I ask one last question, please? Yes. Um, don't you feel sorry for the people who are still in the churches and trying to forgive the enemies still? Even, you know, if they, if they never come out of the churches before the end of the world, before they die? Oh, well, there are all kinds of wonderfully moral people in churches who are not saved. There are wonderfully moral people outside of churches who are not saved. Just because a person is moral and a decent individual and, and keeping the, the golden rule, do unto others as, God, as you would have them do unto you, that in itself is not the evidence of salvation. The evidence of salvation is that we look at the whole Bible. We have an, inner, an intense desire to be obedient to anything and everything in the Bible. And so a person can be just the most wonderful individual, pleasant, happy, uh, morally decent in every aspect, and still be headed right for hell, because maybe their trust is in the fact that their salvation was based on something they did rather than uh, altogether on what Christ has done. Or they, uh, there are other things in their life that show that they don't trust the Bible finally as the whole Word of God. That is, it is not. Uh, they're not ready to be look at anything and everything. They've already decided that they're fine with God, and they don't have to really look beyond the verses they already know. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Brother Camping, I have a question about uh, when someone becomes saved, that um, spirit that or that new creation, does that, is it part of God's spirit? Well, as I indicated to an earlier caller, wonderful things happen when we become saved. First of all, a very, very uh, literal thing happens. We actually receive a brand new soul. It isn't our old soul patched up and, and cleaned up a little bit. It's a new soul. We are born again or born from above, as Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3. And, and in our new soul, we have eternal life. And in our new soul, we never want to sin. Now, that's a fantastic change in our personality and in and it, and it should in uh, make a difference in our whole personality 
But then on top of it, we're now energized by God. Uh, that is, we receive spiritual strength from Him to uh, and an ongoing want to, to do the will of God uh, to a much higher degree uh, than if He had not, if we did not have Him energizing us. And then on top of it, and like I say constantly, I don't understand this, God Himself says He indwells us. God indwells me, yes, I don't understand it, but he does. And so that means I, every true believer is in an intimate relationship with God on a constant basis because he's indwelt by God. And all of this means that he is a different kind of a person than someone who is not saved. And that spirit doesn't communicate with us? The Holy Spirit communicates with us through the Bible. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And if we're a true believer, we have a a love for the Word of God. We delight to read it. And uh, even though it's telling us something uh, that uh, uh, is revolting to our our old nature, uh, to our uh, sinful body, uh, the lusts of the sin, never the, uh, the lusts of the flesh, nevertheless, we're glad that we knew about it, and uh, there is a real desire to get straighten that out in our life because we're happiest when we're doing it God's way. Thank you, Brother Camping. God bless you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Mr. Campin, it's me again. Um, I just wanted to reiterate, the girl called earlier tonight, and she said, would you be willing if Jesus didn't return in 2011 to admit that Jesus comes to each one of us when we die? Uh, she, I guess she was kind of right, because uh, John 14 states, Jesus said, uh, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. But she's missing 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, where the second part of our redemption is our body. Or if you want to comment, maybe. Well, yes, I didn't understand that from her question. But it is true that that when Christ comes, our salvation is completed. We do receive our redeemed bodies, our, our brand new uh, glorified spiritual bodies. And it's also a time, incidentally, when he comes for all of the unsaved, but not as their Savior, but as their judge. How awful! How awful! Because when he comes as their judge, there is no longer any mercy, no possibility of salvation. There's only one thing left, and that is trial, being put on trial. Are you guilty? Are you guilty? And everyone will be found guilty who stands for trial. And we already know what the sentence will be. There's no doubt about it. The sentence is a way to hell. Eternal damnation for this individual who stands here for trial. And that's the terrible, terrible thing that the world has to contemplate as we're rushing pell-mell for our rendezvous with the coming of the Lord Jesus in a few years. But thank you for calling, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Camping? Yes. Was God a, a carpenter? Was God a carpenter? Yes. Jesus, in his human nature, until he was almost 35 years of age, was skilled, uh, was trained as a carpenter. The Bible does teach that. He was busy uh, working like any other human be- uh, being at a craft. And uh, then, of course, once uh, he uh, was baptized and announced as the Lamb of God, he w- wasn't in the carpenter trade anymore. His trade now was to uh, to build lives for the kingdom of God. Where do we find that in the Bible? Matthew, or we find that in Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, we read in uh, uh, verse 3, 
Jesus has come to his hometown Nazareth uh, to preach, and uh, his fellow uh, fr his friends uh, his, uh, who lived in that town said, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of G James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. This, uh, this is a friend of yours from New York. Um, I was wondering if um, you could compare Numbers 2659 Number. with... 26, well, excuse me, Numbers 26, verse 59. 59, yes, sir. Let me look at that a moment. Sure. Verse 59, and the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, whom her mother bare to Levi in Egypt, and she bare unto Amram Aaron and Moses and Miriam their sister. Yes. And now Exodus 6.20, please. Exodus 6.20. Uh, there we read in Exodus 6, verse 20. Uh, and Amram took him Jochebed, his father's sister, to wife. That uh, agrees perfectly with the book of Numbers 26. And she bare him Aaron and Moses. And so far it looks exactly parallel. And the years of the life of Amram were 137 years. Yes. Ah, God introduced some more information that we mm -hmm. have to deal with. And that blows the idea apart. Because if we didn't have that verse, the rest of the verse, we could, we'd have to conclude that uh, Amram married Jochebed and were the immediate parents of, of Moses and Aaron. But when it says that that he was 137 years when he died, and we have to factor that into the other information of the Bible, then we know he could not have been the immediate parents. That's not possible. I wonder how old he was when he gave birth to, to Amram and Jochebed. I mean to Moses, etc. How, how old who was? Uh, Amram. Well, he didn't give immediate birth to them. It was a, it was, oh, I made the uh, it was a grand, great grandson or great great grandson who gave oh. birth, and he was in the line of Amram. And you know, in the Bible, when God speaks about sons, uh, they can be immediate sons or grandsons or great grandsons or great great grandsons. We have to look at all the other information in the Bible about that particular subject to d discover what God has in view. But with that, I have to say good night because we've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.